So, Andrew, our lead of Django District, is sick today. So, Chad and I are going to be taking over on Mike Brown. Chad, no crap. Anything else? Try not to um, So, uh, we're just going to go through a couple of orders of business that Andrew reported us. Um, first, Andrew made the both of us co organizers conveniently, like three weeks ago, and then happened to get sick today, so we had to replace him, which was like perfect timing. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm hoping that he like is planning on getting a job and like fortune telling going forward as his next consulting gig that he's starting. Um, anyway, uh, so I guess you'll be hearing more from us. Um, I'm actually leading the February Django District meetup because uh, Andrew won't be around for that. Uh, more on that later. Uh, so you'll be hearing more from us later. Uh, second item, uh, as Andrew talked about at the last meetup. We're going to have a code of conduct uh, for the group to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as what we expect with uh, personal conduct. So, um, did he send this out to the entire Jago District uh, news group? I think he did. Did you guys have you guys seen this yet? Yeah. Okay. So there's a Jago District uh, repo on GitHub, and in there there's a code of conduct. So if you haven't read through it, just going to read through. It's nothing crazy. Um, what else? So uh, another thing Andrew has talked about was trying to do something different than just our standard presentation format. So next week is going to be the first Django District project night. I believe it's on the 21st. Uh, yeah. Um, so I welcome all of you guys to come to that. It's going to be kind of like a everyone show up and hack <coughs> and collaborate kind of thing. Um, so hopefully that goes great, and I hope we see you all there. Um, and then. Lastly, uh, as I already mentioned, we're having a Django district in February that I'm leading. Um, contact me if you have any interest in speaking or sponsoring. Uh, we're going to host it here as usual. Um, but like I said, we need a speaker, so topics. Uh, I'll reach out to a few people to see who's interested. But if you have an idea, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, again, my name is Mike Brown. And then also food sponsors. We always need food sponsors. So if you're interested in that, again, let us know. So that's all I have. Cool. And then uh, thank you to our sponsors, uh, Track Maven and Wonderful. Um, do you guys want to say anything? Yeah, um, I was going to say, uh, we also host another meetup that might be relevant to uh, a bunch of you guys. Uh, it's the DC Postgres meetup. And then next month's talk is going to actually be uh, Django on Postgres, taking advantage of some features like text search vectors and uh, JSON B, things like that. Um, what yeah. is that? Uh, it is the 2nd of February. Cool. Uh, I'm Fletcher. I head up uh, Track Maven Tech. You are in Track Maven. Welcome. Um, we also have another meetup that may be or may not be relevant to you, depending on the month. Uh, we do a monthly challenge where we just choose new tech every month that we want to learn more about. Uh, so next Monday, uh, the 19th, I believe, uh, here we're having a meetup on data visualization. Uh, people just, for the month, come up with any small hack that they want to learn a little bit about whatever that topic is. We've done Elasticsearch, we've done natural language processing. Uh, we're open to suggestions of other topics you'd be interested in. Uh, so, hope to see you guys at that, and welcome to Thank you. So, I think we're ready to get started. Um, my name is Chad Shryock. I'm a senior software engineer for Gannett uh, out in Tyson's. So we use Django um, for all of our front-end properties. Uh, we're the largest newspaper publisher and um, broadcaster in the US. So um, we started using Django CMS um, internally for some of our new sites that are coming on for marketing type purposes. Um, so I thought I'd give a talk about um, Django 1.7 and Django CMS 3, uh, basically focusing for Django.17 headaches um, most likely to run into. Um, it's a pretty big deck because I have a lot in here. So um, are people more interested in Django 1.7 or are they more interested in Django CMS? Kind of like focus on one or the other. CMS. Yeah. 1.7 is what? Not so. Both. So I'll try to run through it pretty um, quickly. Uh, if anybody, uh, feel free to yell out questions or whatever. Um, I can slow down and talk slow as a moment. So, um, 
So we'll dive into one seven then, and then we'll dump it, uh, jump further. So um, what's new and deprecated in Django one seven? Uh, Python versions changed, so two six is out. Uh, three four is uh, now supported. Geo Django dropped uh, uh, Geo support for 3.1 lower. Uh, uh, Django util simple JSON is out. Um, they uh, want you to use the new uh, just the uh, regular Python JSON uh, stuff. Uh, Geo sitemaps have been deprecated. Um, they will be uh, out in the next release. Uh, Google um, removed support for uh, Geo sitemaps, so Django removed support for them as well. Um, Few management um, commands have gone out of favor. Um, SigDB has been replaced with the new migrations uh, framework. Um, I'll go into that in more detail. Uh, validate, also deprecated. Um, the new check command is replacing it. The check uh, command um, is part of the new checks uh, framework. And then uh, run um, FCGI has also uh, is been deprecated in the two, two releases. Um, something they added to the development server, which is actually kind of nice. Um, when, now when you run your local development server, you'll see everything that's served through static as well. So if you're seeing 404 and stuff like that, you'll see them run through your console. Your uh, console will get much busier these days. So. Um, the, one of the major changes for it is the uh, new model layer. Um, so before I jump into migrations, uh, go through a few of the high-level changes that cause uh, upgrade issues. Um, integer fields now use the min-max of your database. So if uh, uh, the min-max for SQLite is different from uh, MySQL, Django will now use those min-max to do validation on the front end for, so you won't get database errors when you switch between the two. And pretty uh, exception instead. Um, Four keys in many, many fields can now take a callable, so you can do um, uh, filtering based uh, for your fields um, based upon some um, queries, which is really nice. Um, you can now set default permissions and models, uh, and you can create your own as well. Um, just word of uh, caution, uh, you can set it to an empty list if you don't want any default permissions set up at all, but if you set up default permissions, um, remove them, run migrate, and then boot remove them. All your existing permissions for it will remain, so you've got to do your own cleanup for that. If you don't have default permissions in the master class, what will it default to? Uh, it will default to add edit and delete. So. Uh, I just made up a fake one just to show you can add extra edit. Um, there's a new helper class for update or create. So just like uh, you do a get or a create, you can now do a update or create, and it won't return an object back. Um, so query set got uh, two new upgrades uh, in this release. Um, one is a manager can now call query sets or multiple query sets so that um, you can write your query set here and then you can call them from the manager uh, instead of having to do all that work down here. Separates it out a little bit better. Um, the second, and it's really hard to see on the TV, actually, my slides instead of wrong. Um, you can also have query sets become a manager for you. So you can create, now you don't have to create a manager anymore if you're just trying to get to query set stuff. You can just create a query set, and then down here you can say, uh, create where you normally your manager, you just say your query set and then dot as underscore manager. And that will create a manager for you out of your query set without having to do any of the extra work. Um, we have a, two really cool things for um, filtering for queries. Uh, first off is iExact um, allows none now. Uh, and what that means is that if you were to do a uh, object subfilter and do an iExact none off of your field, it will create the SQL statement that will basically say location is null. Um, instead of before, it would say location is blank. You couldn't get to the null uh, values. So now you can actually check against your database against null values. Um, so your string type things just get a little more efficient. And you can actually create custom lookups now. Um, I'm not going to dig down into actually how to create one, 
documentation is really great on it, and it gives like three or four different examples of why you'd want to. Um, one is if you're um, SQL savvy and you write your own functions, you can actually write a lookup to then build your SQL to use your functions. So you can use your functions right in line with your Python stuff. So you get a little bit of a performance boost there. Um, the select related um, off of your query uh, piece can now uh, be chained together. Before you were stuck with having to put them all into one, but now you can chain them and put them in different orders so you can really optimize your uh, query string. And then this is the one that I think is really cool. Um, there's a new prefetch option now. So now when you do uh, prefetch related, you can pass in a prefetch, prefetch option. Um, in there you can do um, complex queries, you can do ordering, you can do all sorts of things so you can limit your uh, many to many or uh, query key uh, stuff down um, really granular without having to do it, without building a uh, template tag to do it for you, or before you pass your main to many, uh, your query into a template tag and have it do some work from the front end. You can now do it all right here um, with a prefetch. So saving the number of database queries and round trips you have to do uh, for the database. Um, and you can now order off of the, um, when you create a relation field, Django actually creates a field in the database uh, with an underscore ID at the end. Um, that's how it does relations. Before you couldn't actually order by on that, you actually had to um, order it off of the, uh, you'd have to do a join on the table um, and do the underscore underscore ID with the underscore underscore PK. Um, now you can do it with just the field name and that doesn't have to do a join in your database table. So it's a, perform a major performance boost because it has to do a join. Just to do an order by. <coughs> So what's uh, out IP address field is uh, been deprecated and it is going to be replaced by a generic uh, IP address field. Um, before you could do a select for update method call on your queries, um, it worked before. In Django 1.6, they um, they changed the way they do their auto their transaction stuff. When they did that, this method no longer made sense, um, and. It, somewhat worked, so they made it now just to an exception instead. So sometimes if you're upgrading, you're like, why am I getting this random transaction exception? This just needs to be replaced. You're most likely not using transactions, so just put it back to the standard. So, schema migrations. Uh, goodbye, Sal. Um, this, is, uh, this is the big thing, and it's a big learning experience. I personally was not a fan of Sal. Um, it was painful to set up or if you wanted to set up later in life, um, I didn't really want to work with you very well. Um, luckily, the Jago core developers, um, one of them being the guy that wrote Sal, felt that it was um, important enough to actually be included in the full framework, um, so they brought it in. Um, SimDB could only create tables and drop tables, it couldn't actually do any altering, migrations can. Um, a lot of people think of this as version control for your database. So what that means is uh, the SIGDB management, the uh, allow SIGDB um, uh, database router and the two signals for it are been deprecated. The new migration pieces have been added. Um, initial data is no longer automatically loaded with migrations. Um, so they require, they, uh, recommend you use run Python and run SQL migrations, which I have an example of. Um, you can use South with Django migrations side by side. Not sure why, um, but you have to upgrade to South 1.0 first. Um, and it was a big headache. South 1.0 got slightly delayed. Um, they were supposed to release at the same time. So you see a lot of your third party packages didn't really upgrade to Django 1.7 support because they were waiting for South to upgrade to do their migration and switch over. So if you want, I can jump down through real quickly through a quick tutorial. Um, just doing a pizza app. Um, so in our models up high, standard model uh, it has one field called name. Um, there. So to create a to start the migration, there's two commands you run. The first is called make migrations. Um, and what it does is it creates a migration for you and it creates a, uh, a uh, migration in uh, uh, PyFile for you. And it looks like this. So 
creates a migration class, and then it has a uh, dependencies property. The property doesn't have any dependencies. If this was, if the field in there was related to a for key, um, it would connect to the dependencies for the uh, for key. So the database would make sure that those fields get created in order, um, and it would keep everything lined up for you. If you try to use a project that's not at migration, it's going to um, tell you about it. Um, so the second one is operations, and this is where you can have an array of many types of operations you can do. One of them being create uh, model. So here you see I'm creating a model. Um, it's named pizza. It gives it the fields, and it gives it all the options in the meta class, and then it's, uh, it's based on the models that model. So after that's modified, most likely you would never ever touch that file um, unless you want to do data migration. Um, but then next you run migrate. And since this is the first time that I ran this command, you can see that it, it built out all the standard Django projects as well, as well as our pizza app. Um, so now it actually touched our database. Make migrations doesn't touch the database at all. Um, migrate actually connects the database and does the work. So if we want to add a new field, we're going to add a new field price. Um, I did make the field required. It's, uh, I'm, it doesn't have uh, blank or null at the end of there. That can be a little tricky if you add fields that are required, um, especially if they're foreign keys or uh, many to many. Um, it gets tricky on having to uh, provide a default. If you don't provide a default, you have to figure out how to um, migrate your data. So you can see here that I ran my make migrations. It says my field does not have a uh, default value. So I have two options. One is I can uh, provide one and they will add it to all the database records in there. The second is to quit this process and go back into your code and add a default value to your field. Um, I chose one and I set all my pizza prices to $22. <laughs> so, and then you can see here that it did the migration and added a field to price, uh, price, price to pizza. So, this is what this field looks like. You can see the dependency links to the app pizza and it links to the migration in 0001 underscore initial. And then the operations is an add field. So then you run migrate field, and it does the same thing as before. It actually makes the, adds the field to the database. Um, so to do a, um, if I'm going too fast, just yell. I'm trying to get through. So um, so make migrations um, to do a. Uh, I'm sorry. To do a data migration, you have to create an empty migration, and you don't have to create it by hand. You can actually call make migrations, tell the app pizza, and that you want an empty one. That will create an empty file for you, um, where you can go in and add your migrations to it. Um, in Django 1.8, you'll be able to name that yourself. Right now, it's the it's auto-generated name. You can rename it. So after they create it for you, you can go rename it, and that's fine. Um, the name doesn't matter to Django. They look at them and look at them that dependency structure to order them. So you can name it whatever you want to. Um, I left this one alone. Normally when I'm working on projects for myself, I'll go rename my migration so I can remember what I did for each one. So if I need to go back and look and see what I changed, I can. Um, so here's the empty one. The only thing it added for me was my dependency. Um, so when you do a data migration, um, this is a run Python one. I'll have to scroll down here. Quick question. Yeah. So if you wanted to um, take the data that used to be right into like initial uh, initial data that JSON or whatever, um, but now instead of using those fixtures, you wanted to do it um, without fixtures. Is the way to do it with an empty migration from the start and then? Yep. Okay. So what you would do is you would create uh, two field uh, two um, uh, methods here. One for forward and one for backwards. Yeah. You don't have to do backwards, but backwards, if you don't do a backwards one, you can't roll back. Um, and I think, I'm pretty sure um, that if you don't provide one, Django just won't roll. You can't, you lose that functionality, period, on that table. Um, so I created two here. All I'm going to do is raise the price and then I'm going to lower the price back down. Um, one thing to note here, and it, I find really interesting, is you don't do a standard import for your model object. You actually use the um, helper method to get a model. And you give it the app name and the model name you're trying to get. 
and Django will go out and create you the model at that time. So say my current model, I'm like four or five uh, migrations down, my current model doesn't have a price field anymore, this would break if I did a standard import. What this does for me is it builds me that model at that snapshot so it will always run the same way every single time. And then um, the next one, the next one. Does it does it still have frozen like, models in the migration? Like it didn't sound for a it, it knows based off of all those different um, pieces. So it can go, it can determine um, the state of your model based off your previous migrations and it uses that dependency tree. Oh, I see. So it will like, run through your migrations for that app, that app and like, get to the state that it needs to be. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So they do it, they run it all the time. Um, question that uh, the big issue I think with South is if two people were at node 3 at the same time and committed them, it usually mucked with South the lore. Will this work with that better as a dependency list? Let me break up. It does. These numbers are here for humans, like the 002, mm -hmm. are here for humans. They're not here for um, the machine. The machine uses the dependency list. You can name it whatever you want. Okay. It's all based on the file name. So whatever you name your file name is whatever your migration is. And you can have multiple dependencies. So like you could say this requires pizza, uh, this dependency, and then you could say a different app. So that it runs it in the right order. Um, so basically, I loop through, I set the upgrade the price, I save it, and then I do the opposite to reduce it. Um, so then my uh, operation is called run Python instead of create model or add uh, add field. I call run Python. I pass in the raise price, which is my forward function, and then. I am passing in the reverse code, so my reverse code is lower price. So that lets me be able to do a um, rollback. So it's like a standard migrate. It, it applies it, and it's successful. So to do a rollback, it's actually really, really easy. Um, same migrate command you give to your app, and then you tell it what uh, migration you want to roll back to. I'm rolling back one. I could roll all the way back to initial if I really wanted to. Um, so you can see here that I'm targeting a specific migration. I'm targeting this one from the app pizza. And I'm unapplying pizza 003 auto and the timestamp. Um, if I was jumping multiples, you would see it unapply that number. And it's just rolling back one at a time. And it'll follow the list backwards. So completely rewind time. Just really close. Yep. Um, so when you do these migrations, these are the these are like what the um, system admin would do. The, you know, data, in other words, it's changing data that the system admin would change. But what if you had something where, like, um, you're keeping track of a user's addresses, and the user was able to, uh, you know, make changes to the address themselves um, through the browser, but you want to keep track of the old addresses? How would you do that? Um, See if I can think, uh, make sure I understand the question. So the, the data is live, which is a given. This will always run against um, live data. Your reverse data for there, you would have to figure out how to reverse that data back in time. Most likely, you're going to keep your current data because you're always going to want your current data. The user probably doesn't need their own address unless you store it in a different table or you keep it in somewhere else. Um, okay, yeah, those are my questions. You have to. So sort of take the extra step, create another table. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the same way it would go through if you were to add a field that was required, but you don't have the need to move data tables around data. You would do create. You create your migration. Then you would do your data migration to the new table, and then you would do the migration to remove the old. So you would step out your stuff so that you could go forward and back. Does that make sense? Well. Enough. Okay. Um, so just a few notes about it. Um, SyncDB is deprecated. Um, when you switch over, you will have to run the create super user command. Um, SyncDB used to do that automatically for you if it knew it created a brand new um, database. But uh, you have to create super user yourself now. Um, and if you're writing your own custom fields, you will have to put a deconstruct method on it. That deconstruct method tells it how to roll back. So if you have a special field, that deconstruct method says how to reverse. Um, 
The next one is what Django calls shadowing model fields, which is really a really weird name. It really just means multiple red herrings or clashing ideas. Um, before, if you had two models, uh, article and book, um, and you were creating a third model from that called book review, um, Django would silently let it pass. They would pick an ID field to use, most likely the first one, and you might get data loss. Um, the Django documentation uh, has an example of how you would actually get data loss by doing this. There's a specific way you will get data loss every single time. Um, Django 1.7 actually won't, the, the, the new system checks framework will actually lock it. Um, your app won't even start, your migrations won't run because that will fail. Um, so there are actually two ways to fix it now. Um, one is you can create two auto fields on both of them and set them as the primary key. Um, that's what Django does in the background for you if you don't specify a primary key. Um, you just have to give it a specific name. Then when you go to book review, you, it will create its own ID field and it will have the two ID fields here and you won't lose it. Um, the other is to create a class called piece. Um, it has the ID field and then author, I mean, article and book both um, inherit from it and then book review inherits from the book. Um, the one thing you still can't do is you still can't do like a circular thing where book review then needs to merge with piece. Um, the ID field will clash. But you can still, you can do multiple inheritance this way around and that's really nice. So that's the model section. Does anybody else have any questions? App loading. App loading got a major overhaul this time, um, which is actually I think much needed. Um, one of the main the, the main thing that changed is the startup sequence. Um, before your model name was specifically tied to your app name. Um, that's why you <coughs> couldn't delete your models.py file when you did your app wouldn't exist anymore because they were tied. So what they did in 1.7 is they moved all of your stuff to an app registry. This brings us a lot of really new, nice things. One is we can delete our models.py file now if we're not using it. Um, you can run code at startup before Django starts up. So if you need to do something else like start other systems or whatever automatically, you can do that before Django even starts up. Um, application names can now be customized, so you're not stuck with the um, lowercase or uh, smaller names. Um, the admin is now auto discoverable. So before in the URLs, before you had to add um, your admin dot auto discover. You can just delete that out now. It's automatically done for you. Um, and another nice thing is that um, import issues are easy to find because they come up a lot earlier in the stack than before, and you get a better um, stack trace because. Where it becomes a big headache is all the standalone scripts. So everybody out there that wrote Django unit test cases, and they're using um, some test uh, suite to run them, most likely they have a standalone script standing in between the two. The standalone script now needs to call Django.setup. Oh, um, if not, you'll get an app registry not uh, app registry not ready exception, but it's easy to fix with two lines of code. Um, also, the way you wire uh, whiskey up in 1.3 is no more. Um, they finally took it out of the code. Um, the Django 1.4 way is now the way. Um, if you have a Django 1.3 app, um, you're still using it. It's pretty amazing. Um, so, installed <coughs> apps got a lot more importance now because it is now the place where the app registry gets uh, configured. Um, so some new error messages come about because of this. One, uh, two apps that have the same exact label before uh, Django would pick one. Um, most of the time it's the first. Um, now if you have two, uh, you have to use an app config. Um, if you have two apps that both have the same management commands, um, before Django, so say you have two apps both have run server in them, before Django would take the first on the list, I mean the last on the list, now they take the first on the list. Um, and middleware classes, if you install the session authentication or uh, message app from Django, um, 
then your middleware classes need to be uh, specified. Before Django 1.7, they automatically added to the middleware for you. Now you have to add it, um, mainly because of order. Um, middleware runs in a certain order every single time, so that way you specify the order you want it in. So that's, um, that's the app loader. Any questions? Cool. Uh, system checks framework. Oops, too far. Um, I don't know how many of you have started your new Django 1.7 server and you see all these really awful warning messages and you don't go down. Um, that is the new system checks framework. Um, by default, it checks four things. Uh, models, and make sure all your models can run successfully. Uh, signals, uh, checks your admin functionality is set up correctly. And it checks compatibility. Most of what you guys will see when you start a server is compatibility issues. Um, those are like, the number one thing everybody is really seeing right now is the get underscore query underscore set was renamed to get underscore query set. Um, so there's a warning out there saying it's been deprecated, switch over to the So until those are removed, you'll keep seeing more messages. You can write your own checks as well. So if you're writing your own app and you want to check to make sure certain things exist, you can write your own checks as well. And your, app, your server won't start, um, migrations won't run until So, Q layer. So, we got a new JSON response, um, just like HTTP response, except now it returns JSON natively. You don't have to do all that extra setup work yourself by calling HTTP response, passing in the mod type and all that stuff. Um, it only does dictionaries. You can tell it to do arrays, uh, root arrays as well, but you have to specify it, a uh, flag. Um, it does not automatically do model work which I think is a really big failure in Django's part. Um, you still can't just take a Django, uh, uh, you can't just encode a model object straight to Django, so, which is really not cool. So you still have to write serializers. So Django has like a JSON serializer in it for transport stuff. It does, but you still have to serialize a lot of things. Um, if you're using dates and numbers, you have to write a serializer. Why they don't just give you a serializer? At least for the main fields, if you write your own fields, I can see you having to write a serializer, but the main Django integer field, decimal field, should have a serializer associated with it, but it doesn't. So. Um, permission decorator. Um, so now in your view, in your function, you can actually pass in what permissions you need to even let this run. Um, if you're not logged in, it will forward you to the login page. Um, if you don't have the permission on your account, then you will be, um, you'll get the standard HTTP uh, security uh, page. There's now new middleware for current site, so it'll add the current site to your request so you don't actually have to go fetch it every single time anymore. It's therefore automatically in cache, so um, performance boost. Form's got a lot of new things. I'm only hitting one of the major ones that I think um, are important. Um, you can now add an error directly to the errors list. Before you had to go find the underscore errors array, add to it, and um, it erased a lot of data when you did Anyway, now when you add errors, it will actually pass the metadata that you added. So before, if you actually created an error from scratch, and you set the code and the params on said object, once you add it to the error list, they disappear, um, which is really, really annoying because sometimes you want to be able to do um, business logic off of errors. You, know, you have to actually look at the actual string and code it. And now you can set a code and pull it off yourself. Um, the other thing they added is the error list now has an as JSON function. So you can actually get all your error messages, including the code and the parameters, as a JSON object. Um, so your, um, <coughs> your API should get a lot smaller than that. Uh, radio and checkboxes now have the ID for and ID for label field. So before, if you built out a form by hand, you just call it a form by table function that would generate a table for you. If you actually build out a custom uh, HTML form and you try to do a radio or a checkbox, you had to make your own IDs, you had to do your own form, you had to link them all yourself. Um, all the other fields had ID for and ID label. So you could do it. 
uh, without having to do any work. They finally added it <laughs> after many years. Um, you can specify a blank option now in your um, choices array, um, choices couple. And you can set either a none or a blank depending on what your database field you want to set. If you set none, it'll actually set an all in your database table. If you set a blank, it'll set an empty string. Um, before, if you had a form and you subclassed it, you couldn't remove fields. Whatever your parent form had, that field was set in stone. Now you can actually say, like, here I have a registration form. One, it has a birthday field, my name form. I just want everything the same. I just don't want the birthday. I can actually say birthday equals none, and it'll take it off the form for you. So you don't actually have to run through and find it, change it to a hidden field, and do all that extra work. You can actually have it do it for you. Templates. So a few filters about some upgrades finally. The time filter is now time zone aware, which is a big deal. I don't know how many of you have ever had to take a time zone string and try to get into a date function to actually display something usable to your users. Um, it never looked, the format string didn't look at C's, T, O, all the various different time zone strings. Um, so you had to end up writing your own template tag and doing all sorts of extra work. Now the time uh, filter is aware. Um, before we had truncate characters filter, it would truncate, if you passed HTML into it, it would truncate right in the middle of your HTML tag if it was at that point. Now we have a truncate cares with HTML, and it's aware of what tags are open, and it will automatically close them. So it will truncate at that text spot, and it will close all your tags for you. So, jump over to admin. Um, customization. Um, you can now change the site header, the site title, and the index title without having to override templates in um, uh, you don't have to override templates anymore. You can actually, in your admin, one of your admin.py files, you can just call admin site, um, site header, and then you can just give it a string. And it will change it across the board. So, no more having to ship something to a client, your client's upset because it says Django administration. You can actually make it say your, um, your brand. So, the change list got a few notable things. Um, that today in the now buttons in the admin form actually uh, know the time zone you're in. Before it would use your browser time um, and it would try to calculate it, but it never really did a good job of that. Um, now it'll do it for you and it'll give you a warning saying that you're different from the server time. You can disable links to the edit page. Um, I've done a few projects where I have a small table, a few columns, and I just make it. I use um, the edit forms field and just make my entire field editable. I can actually turn off the links now. I just won't even have to go to a page. I can do all right in one page. Um, you can disable the view on site button. Um, you just add the view on site flag to false. Um, so this one's kind of hard to explain. The change list order. So in the admin field, you can on your model or in your admin model. Uh, class, you can add um, functions that act as a database field for display purposes. So um, here I created a stylized name field. So if the price of my pizza is greater than twenty dollars, I actually set the color of the text in my admin list to red. Um, so to do that, I take it. I, I say allow tags equals true. That puts the safe filter on it. And then now, before you could say admin order field. Let's say name, so it actually you can actually order that field based off the name. Now you can actually put a uh, dash in front of it, and that will do the reverse the sending order. Um, so before you could do a URL to override initial data, which I never knew until I was playing with this. Um, now you can actually in your admin, your model admin class, you can actually add a method and you can pass in um, uh, initial data that will override the initial data off of your model. So um, you, get a you may pass the request in, so if you can pull off the request, you can do some logic to build out some initial data for, for your users. And last, um, there's a new register decorator for the admin um, model admin class. So you just say at admin.register, and then you pass in your class name. That is all, you can also pass in multiple class names. So I could make this like, a generic admin thing, you can pass in a whole bunch of uh, classes, so you don't have to create 
all of these empty classes for each individual and register them all. You can do it all from one um, specific place. So that's the Django section. And then, um, oops, too far. The uh, Django CMS section. Is there any questions before I jump? Um, for Django registration? Mm -hmm. I've been confused as to whether I should use that, or apparently there's something new called Django Registration Redux, except there seemed to be some kind of um, disagreement out there as to who's maintaining it, so I wasn't sure whether to switch to it, but it has certain advantages. Which would you use? Um, I haven't even played with that one yet at all. I've just used the straight up install apps and just let Django do its normal build-in functionality. Um, you can create an app. In your initial Pi file, you can tell it what app config to use by default, um, and then you can set all your stuff up in there. Um, that's all that I've ever needed to do. I haven't had to do anything else other than that, so um, I'll have to look into it. Yep. Um, the permission decorator. Yep. Uh, can I put that around the class, or do I have to put the dispatch method? Or? You can put it on, I'm pretty sure, I don't really use classes a lot. Um, you can do it on your class, but if you override a function, you can add it to there, Okay. I think. Um, I, that's my guess. I don't know 100% sure. Um, all right, so um, I'm pretty new to Django CMS. Um, I was trying to use a CMS uh, project called Django Fluent before Django CMS. Um, Fluent, I tried very hard to get them up to 1.7, um, Django 1.7 support, and then I just gave up after a month and a half of headache of upgrading and opening pull requests and um, unraveling all their problems. <coughs> but trying to support Django 1.4 and 1.7 is just nearly impossible. Um, so because of that, I switched over to Django CMS and um, been very happy. Um, the new big feature in Django... Did, did you consider any other... Um, Django-based CMS, like Mezzanine or anything else? Uh, no, just those two. Um, I'm, I, I build a framework of a CMS for other things, so I can power, I can use my one framework and do a whole bunch of sites really quickly. Um, so they, these were the most customizable ones that I found out there. Um, what they added in 3.0, which I was going to make my own in Django Fluent, is front-end editing. So you actually see a live preview of your page, you double-click, you can edit, save it, and publish it. Um, no more going through multiple layers of admin interfaces to update the page. Um, it's plugin-based, so every Django app can be con converted into a plugin by adding a new plugin uh, Pi file. Um, there's also a ton of um, ones out there already that you can just um, pip install and add to your install base and it's available. Um, it has permission management. I haven't had to set that up yet. Um, pretty much if you had to log into our system, to our sites that we're building these today, um, you could publish. Um, we haven't had to do anything less than that. So, But it has it. just haven't used it yet. Um, it is international. Um, it currently is translated into 40 plus languages. Um, and it makes it really easy to publish your content in multiple languages, and it can do fallback. So if you translate a page, uh, you didn't translate a page into Spanish, and your fallback language is English, it will automatically serve the English version instead of the Spanish version, um, which is really nice. It has a very large and active uh, developer community. It has a Google Plus community that is um, a lot of the core developers uh, hang out on. Um, so you can ask a question, usually a core developer will answer your question for you, um, which is really, really helpful. <coughs> Um, they have a few more major selling points, uh, pretty URLs, um, SEO, so it makes it SEO friendly. There is a Django shop plugin to it, so you can do e-commerce type things. Um, I have not used that at all. Um, there's blog support, um, and then they claim that there's a Google Analytics built into it. I have not seen that, so just throwing that out there. So installation and configuration. Normally, it would be really, really easy. Um, you just pip install the installer, and then you create a new project, and it sets everything up for you. The problem with their current installer is not Django 1.6 or 1.7 enabled. Um, some of the documentation is a little misleading. Some of it is Django 1.6 enabled, um, but I don't know what to believe. Because um, I'm going for the latest. I don't feel like upgrading once they have the ability to upgrade. So. 
So to install from scratch or add to an existing project, there's a lot of steps, but it's not complicated. Um, it really is adding the installed apps plus any plugins um, that you need to install. They provide a few out of the box. Um, the piece that I'm uh, disappointed about is until CMS, uh, the next CMS version, which is uh, 3.8, that's a typo, um, you have to manually configure your migration classes. So they're still using South as their primary migration tool. Um, in, their, in the 3.1 um, CMS version, they will switch. You can configure South, but it, by default, you use um, the Django migrations. Um, you have to add a few middleware classes um, and add a, two template uh, context processors. And then you define your templates. Um, one thing that I found really weird and uh, very limiting, all your templates have to be in the same directory. Um, so, and by default, it looks at your template durs and it uses the first one. You can set it. I just usually just set the first one because it's easier. Um, and then I have my standard templates uh, for that. And then my CMS templates is where I define what template I have. Here I have three, uh, front, a story, and a one column. Um, and then you add your URLs. If you're only doing one language, um, then you don't have to do the international part. Um, this is how you would set up the international. So by default, it would say uh, each language has a root, so slash en slash whatever your language code is. Um, so to redirect from your root to your default language, you have to do a redirect. So that's why I have the two um, URL patterns there. So then the next thing you do is to migrate it, create your super user. Um, they have a management command off of the CMS uh, app called check. That'll run through a whole bunch of checks. It'll check, make sure templates are there, it'll make sure that your database is set up correctly, uh, permissions are like, all the major things are ready to go and it can be ran. And then you can just run your server and it works like a standard Django app and if you go to it, you should get a success page. So, um, which I can show. Uh, I can do my mouse there. So this is actually it. And actually go to edit mode. So now I'm actually logged in. I have the Django CMS toolbar up here. Um, when you're logged in and you're in edit mode, um, the toolbar will be always there for you. Um, you have the ability to add to the toolbar or customize the toolbar as well. So you can add things for people. Um, here you can switch. I set up just English and Spanish in this example. Um, by default, you can jump to your admin things. And then um, that just jumps you up. Um, but you can hit here, and here's your standard admin. You can still hit the slash admin, uh, but this has it sitting side by side. So if we want to add a page, we can add here, we can give it a home. I can type home. There we go. Um, my menu title. So one thing to know about pages, there are two ways to extend pages. One is you can extend a non-language specific um, data set, and you can also add what they call title extensions. Title extensions have all the language features. So say you want to add um, another description field or a promo field, you could add a title extension, and that would get um, pulled apart uh, for language. So, here is my empty home. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it's hard to see because of there. So this is my, I'm currently in content view. If I had stuff on this page, you would actually see the full content of the page displayed. But my, I have an empty page right now, so you can see the structure. Um, and this is where I can actually put content into. So these black areas are where you can put drag content into. Um, 
lost my mouse. There we go. And this is how you can add. Does that say file? No, no one up. No. Go down. There you go. So now I added um, this file to the page. I can go back to content view now and preview my page. Well, anyway, it would show the image, I promise you. Um, and you can see that you can double click to re-edit it. Um, it doesn't have a nice uh, medium type editor yet. I'm guessing that they'll eventually end up that way. Um, right now you have to double click your plugin. It opens up the E4 and you change it. You can hit save and you can see it. Um, and those changes are not available until you actually publish a page. So right now you can see the switch over here in the top right says draft. I'm actually in draft mode. I can toggle back to publish mode uh, to a live mode and see that. Um, the other thing, when you're ready to actually publish it, you can hit the publish button and it'll actually publish it live. Um, so you'd actually be able to see the page live. So let me see if I can get back to my presentation now. Okay, so really quickly I'll go through uh, pages and templates. A template is just a standard HTML file. It has two new tags that you can add. Um, they're under the CMS tags. One is placeholder, and then you give it a name. Um, placeholder is that one of those gray bars. So everywhere you put a place bar holder, they'll add another uh, bar to the area. Um, a placeholder can hold one or more, uh, zero or more um, plugins, so you can keep adding to it. Um, a static placeholder is uh, really interesting. A static placeholder is the same placeholder across multiple pages. So if you have four pages that all use this template, they'll all have that. So if you change the plugins in that static uh, placeholder and you publish it, that, those changes will be on every single page. So um, say you have a front that you have a featured uh, box that you want across every front, you can put a static. It's perfect for footers where you can just build one footer out into your CMS and it builds it out for you. Um, or your A side, say you have a featured story for the day, you can just keep updating one spot. Um, and that'll do that for you there. Um, to add a menu, there's a show menu tag that's um, part of the menus app. Um, you can also override the default output. By default, it outputs li tags. Um, you can pass in a template name here at the end and it will use that to iterate over. Instead, um, and then these numbers here are to configure how deep um, it goes. So you can go, you can have it be pretty flat, you can have it do sub nav, um, so you can do rollover type things as well. Um, so uh, you guys already seen the pages. Um, I do want to show you one other thing. So I'm open it. You can see now that I have a, because I'm on a page, I actually have a page um, nav, I have a history nav as well, and a language, so I can switch between all those different things. Um, if you added title stuff, you can do all the different settings in here as well. Um, the other nice thing is that you now do is, say you build out your page and it's all nicely done, you can actually save it as a page title, so you can repeat and create over again. So say you build out your story page and all you gotta do is change one little area, you can save it as a page type story, and then when you create a new page, you can pick that page type, and it'll pre-build all those things out for you. Um, you can also find publish in there as well. So I can easily, easily create.
So a valve and home are both at the same level now. If you want to, you can easily drag it in there, and now it's moved underneath home. So now you should see it up here in the nav say home and valve as well. And you can see your published status here. Green means that it's published. Um, it's usually a blue color. It looks kind of gray in here. Um, you can see that I didn't set any Spanish up, and the, it's in the menu. So you can kind of use this to see what the status of all your pages are as well. I lost my notes. Um, so out of the box, they provide a few plugins for you. Um, they aren't great, I would um, say that much. Um, some of these don't work with uh, Django 1.7 yet either. But I will say um, that the CMS plugin called Filer, there's also a non-CMS version of it called Django Filer that it uses, adds full uh, file management to Django. So you can create folders, upload files, and manage it just like you would any other file system. Um, you can move files around. Um, you can add that uh, CMS plugin filer field type to your uh, models. And when you click on the widget, it will actually open up a file manager for you. You can select your files off of that. Um, it's really, really nice. Um, and you can easily create other um, formats. So if you wanted to create um, a graphic type or SVG type, you could easily do that. And then it builds default display types well, this too. So when you drag it onto a page, it'll know how to render it. Um, so everybody in the Django CMS world uses that plugin. Um, the actual documentation used to actually say, pretty much go use this plugin. So, you know, when you say the, the common plugins are not all used, well, it's a pretty big deal. Um, Yes and no. I find that I don't really use the common plugins anyway, because I have my set of apps already out, and I've made them all plugins. So the only one I really use is the text. Um, I made my own teaser because I have my, my designers giving my own style that I have to follow. Um, so I made my own teaser. Text is the only generic one that I really use out of box. All my other stuff I've built myself. I've either used the filer to do because it gives you so much more functionality, or I've just used my own. And the text works well with 1.7? Yes. Um, the other thing text can do is it can, um, anything that says that it's text enabled, um, basically if it's a span, you can also drag in line. So it can, a text plugin can have multiple plugins inside it. So you can actually build a very complex layout just on it. Um, it's really, really easy to do a custom plugin because you can take a standard Django app. You start by doing the standard manage pi start app and give it your app name. Um, the, um, this is an existing app that they use as an example for a poll. So normally there's a poll, plug, uh, poll class here. My plugin extends this CMS plugin uh, class type. And the CSS, CMS plugin class type extends model stuff. So it's really a Django model at the heart. Um, it, this one only has a pull uh, field, and it's called foreign key to the other one. So when you drag it on the page, when you double click it, it'll open up, and you'll choose what poll you want to display in that spot. So to actually make it become a plugin, you add a CMS underscore plugins.py file. Um, and then in that, you add a CMS plugin base uh, extended class. And then you can set different things on it. Um, so you can tell it what template to use. There's also a way to do dynamic templates based on data. Um, tell it what model to use. You can name it that, that drop down list when you want to add things. You can order things and group things, uh, all your templates together in a certain way. Um, you can tell it that it can have children, it can't have children, it allows text, it doesn't. There's a lot of configuration you can, you can go into. Um, you can also say that I only allow certain plugin types underneath me and I can only go in a certain plugin type. So there's a lot of configuration you can do and play around in here. Um, and then in particular, just like you would add in class. Um, plugin template, again, looks exactly the same. Um, instance is what gets passed back to you. So instance is your CMS poll. Uh, I mean, your CMS plugin model class. So you can see here is our instance. 
pole was that one field on it. Under pole, there was a field called question. Um, and then it built out the form, um, which is a standard form. So, any questions? So, and just like normal, you would add it to installed apps, make migrations, migrate it, and then you can add it to your page. Um, so, that is really it. Um, Jagger CMS is a really awesome um, CMS. It's very flexible. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't go into. There's something called app hooks, where you can take existing apps and URLs for it and embed it into your CMS. So. Say you're a publisher site and you built a um, elections app and it has its full URL structure. You can actually build a page in there, put an app hook to it, and it acts like a page. And your URL structure will build off of that. So you can drag your app around. So say you move your elections 2014, you want to move, make it 2015, you can drag it down and it now is under your 2015 folder or your 2015 page. Um, you can customize the menus, you can customize um, all the different pages extensions, the title extensions. It's a very, very, um, all the templating stuff is uh, completely flexible and all. So it's a very, very cool um, CMS platform. So. Any questions? I know that's a lot to cover. Um, and I try to talk as fast as possible so I can get it on. So. Um, uh, Django was born in the newspaper industry, and that's your industry. The, um, to what extent do you have end users who need to work in Django, and if so, how do they handle it? What are they, you know, a reporter, for example, what are they working with, or what's the closest thing to an end user that can do? So, at Gannett, um, our CMS is not the Django admin tool, or Django CMS. Um, we have a few marketing sites that marketers will be eventually using this. It hasn't rolled out yet, but will be soon. Um, we do have um, some storytelling teams and some interactive teams that do spin up small Django projects that use the admin tool. It worked okay for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Django CMS was really nice um, because uh, we have a site configuration team that all they do is configure and they're going to be maintaining this. Um, I gave them a preview and a mini um, tutorial lesson through the CMS um, for the new site that they'll be maintaining and they're very, very excited about it. Mainly because they can see it, double click it, change it, see it change and they, before they actually publish it. So They don't have to open a separate page. I think somebody in the back had a question. I'll ask another one there. And again, I'm, I'm the newbie, so I'm asking tough questions. But big picture, um, Python 1.7, Django CMS 3, where is it going in the next year or two? Do you have a sense? Or, you know, kind of where are we sort of in terms of medium term roadmap or that kind of thing? Um, Django wise, um, uh, Jacob, the one of the founders of Django, actually just resigned from the board probably in the last year, I think. Um, so there's like a new class, um, and they're pushing through huge changes. Like this was 1.7 is a huge release. 1.8 is already at the same level as this. Um, there's a new template, um, new templating changes um, are coming in to where in 1.8 you'll be able to see. Um, you can use multiple template languages. So if you want to use Mustache or any other templating language, you can alongside Django. You can mix and match your templates. Um, that's a big change that's coming. Um, the new Django core development team is very active. Um, they're constantly doing things and pushing the releases out. Uh, the Django CMS team, same thing. They're very active and busy as well. Um, they're based in, I think, the UK. Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland. Yeah, I think it's Switzerland. Okay. Across the pond. Um, they're um, backed by a company, and um, so there's an actual company sitting behind it, building and pushing the open source platform forward as well. Um, there's also a large community behind it. Um, Django CMS is um, adding a lot of um, performance improvements behind the scenes. Um, 
3.1 is changing. So right now, when you drag those files around, um, the SQL tool they use to do the um, to save the that tree um, gets very messy pretty quickly. There's a management command you can run to like pull everything back in order. Um, Django CMS 3.1, they're um, changing from the uh, app they're currently using over to one called Treebeard, um, and it is much, much stabler um, and much faster also. Um, they've already made that migration, it's in the depth development branch. Um, so 3.1, they just released 3.8 and 3.9 this week. Um, so I, they're definitely moving. One reason I gave up on Drupal was because they each version was sort of almost a new thing. All this progress is good, but you know, are the are the apps lagging way behind? And it's kind of this hard to kind of pick a point and say this is when I, these are the tools I want to use because because of all the changes. Django one point seven definitely had a little bit of that problem, but a lot of that problem was due to South. Um, everybody was waiting on South one point zero to come out, um, and. 1.0 is when they did a lot of the, when Django and migrations and South migrations can work side by side, so you can pick which one you want to use. Um, so a lot of apps just never upgrade to 1.7 until they could upgrade South. Um, the South was used to support Django 1.7 until version 1. So uh, that held the community back a little bit. Um, hopefully going forward in 1.8, um, people will get more excited about it and upgrade faster. I don't think they're going to do the amount of changes they did. They did a lot of underlying architecture changes in this release. Um, I don't think they, they'll do that again. Um, if they do, I think they'll pretty much keep it per version. So like, templates will be this version. Um, I think they'll do, um, the changes they made were really hard to do backwards compatibility on. They do a really good job at keeping backwards compatibility for at least two versions. Yeah, that that made it difficult, and um, the testing stuff broke. Um, just little things that just made it seem like a big mountain. Um, I was using Jagger 1.6 and upgraded to 1.7 seamlessly without any problems, but the people that were going from 1.5 to 1.7 had massive. Problems. And it took a lot longer. So. Cool. Thank you, guys. Uh, I know that Track Maven's hosting a data visualization meetup on um, um, Hack, Hack Pad, as they're called. Um, yeah. That's on Monday, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, a monthly challenge. So, I was trying, I almost had my visualization in this presentation. I had a live voting and rearranged deck thing in here, but um, Reveal JS and D3 just didn't work together. So, um, and surprisingly, they came out with a version 3 of Reveal, and I think they fixed my problem. If I'd known that on my weekend, we'd do that. But, um, yeah, so Monday I'll have my visualization piece for you.